Okay, we come today to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And we begin our study in verse 27. And Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. As we come to our study today, just a reminder that last time Jesus was talking to a woman from Samaria, which is the middle section in the land of Israel. And they they were talking by a well, which was outside of the city. <clears throat> and they were alone because the disciples went into town to buy food. And Jesus was talking to this woman about spiritual things. And so with this in mind, we come to verse 27, and it, it says, And upon this came his disciples, and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? Nobody said to the woman, the disciples, no one asked her, What do you want? What are you doing here? Or no one asked Jesus, What are you doing? The disciples returned, and they were surprised to see Jesus talking to a woman in public, <clears throat> something which was not done in those days, especially a rabbi or a teacher like Jesus was to be talking to a woman in public. It wasn't against the Bible for a man to talk to a woman, but it was against social custom. Jesus did it because he did not govern his life by, by social customs or social norms. He was governed by the word of God, and that was it. Social customs change. Social customs are at times contrary to God's word. Stick to the word of God and you'll be safe. That's what Jesus did. <clears throat> Verse 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city. Let's stop there for a second. She left her water pot. Do you remember how important this water was to her? Last week, She was. it was very important, and it was. Getting water was not an easy task at all back in those days. It was the women's job to get water, and it was not an easy thing to do. And it was important to this woman, but not anymore. She left her water pot. That water didn't mean much to her now that she has met the Son of God. Knowing Christ makes everything else seem pretty small. Having a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ makes everything else seem pretty small. Knowing Christ puts everything else in life in proper perspective. 29. So, she goes into town, and she talks to the men. In verse 29, she says, Come, see a man who told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? She says, you got to see this guy. He has told me everything that I've ever done. Jesus knew all about this woman, even though he had never met her personally. And Jesus told this woman about her past life, and actually about her present life. And he could do that, because Jesus is God. And God knows everything about everything. He knows everything about us. God knows every single thing that we have ever said or ever done. He knows every single thing that we have ever wanted to do. Or wanted to say. Or will do or will say. He knows it all. God knows every little detail about us. The amazing thing is, with all of our flaws that he knows all about... He still loves us. He still wants us to be his child. 
And he still wants us to be with him forever. And he still wants us to say, Jesus, take control of my life. Let me live the way you want me to live and save me from hell. He still wants that. 30. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. The men of the city listened to what this woman told them concerning Christ. And after they got done listening to her, they came, they came out to check Christ out for themselves. That's very important. That they didn't just take her word for it. They checked Jesus out. They investigated Jesus for themselves. Every single person must care enough about their own soul to check out what Christ has to say for themselves. In fact, I will say this. There is no hope for anyone who doesn't care enough about God or themselves, their immortal soul, to check and see what Jesus has to say, what the Word of God has to say about getting forgiveness, about getting eternal life, about avoiding hell. If people don't care, care enough to investigate, then they're in trouble. The Bible says everyone must carry their own load. Salvation is the personal responsibility of every single human being. No one can do it for you. You can't do it for anyone else. 31. In the meanwhile, his disciples besought him, saying, Master, eat. Well, the disciples went into town, and they brought supper, and they want Jesus to enjoy it. 32. But he said unto them, I have food to eat that ye know not of. <clears throat> Jesus says, You want to give me food? You're trying to give me food. But I have food. <clears throat> I have a type of food that you don't even know exists. 33. Therefore said his disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him anything to eat? They're thinking, how did Jesus get food way out, way out here in the middle of nowhere? We went into town to give him, get him food and give us food because we didn't have any food. Then we come back and he says he's got food. How did he get food? 34. <clears throat> Jesus saith unto them, My food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So Jesus was not talking about hamburgers and french fries or any other kind of literal food. He was talking about food for the soul. Think about it. Good food satisfies. And Jesus is saying, I've been doing something that really satisfies. I've been talking to a lady about spiritual things. I've been talking about I've been talking to her about saving her soul, how to be right with God. And Jesus was saying, Now that satisfies. Many things are important. Food is one of those things. Many things are enjoyable. Food can be one of those things as well. But nothing is as important and nothing is as enjoyable as living for God and being right with God and being used by God and, by, and being used by God by serving others. Nothing is as important as being used by God by serving others or being kind to others or sharing the word of God with others. Nothing is as important as that. Nothing is as satisfying as that. 35. Say not ye, Jesus says, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Jesus is saying, there are a lot of souls in the world who are ripe and ready to be picked for God. They're ready to be saved. They need to be picked. They need to be harvested. Someone says, well, how, how are they harvested? How do you do that? You give them the word of God. 
You harvest souls for Christ by giving them the Word of God and, for, and by praying for them. That's how it's done. You give them the Word of God. Or you help give them the Word of God. That tells them to repent and to receive Christ and to make Jesus their Savior. Ask Him to be their Savior. Make Jesus their Lord. You harvest souls for Jesus by telling them about how Jesus died on the cross and paid for their sins so that they don't have to go to hell. You tell them. You give them the Word of God or you help give them the Word of God somehow. If people do not hear the Word of God, their ripe souls are going to rot. That's why I don't pull any punches when it comes to proclaiming the Word of God. That's why I don't proclaim psychology. That's why I don't tell story after story after story. I proclaim the Word of God. And I don't do it because it's popular, because it isn't. I do it because it's what Jesus wants. And I do it for the sake of the souls out there who are ready to be saved. If someone will just tell them how, that, how that's done. <clears throat> Jesus continues in verse 36. Talking about the harvest of souls. And he says, And he that reapeth receiveth wages... And gathereth fruit unto eternal life, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And here is that saying true, one sows and other reaps. I sent you to reap that on which you bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. Let me sum this up for you. Jesus says there's a lot of souls that need to be harvested for God. And then in these verses he makes it clear. Jesus is saying, God will, God will repay you. For helping to get out the word of God. He will repay you. For living for Jesus. You'll get your wages. God will pay you with joy. And satisfaction. In this life. And he will pay you, repay you with eternal rewards of some kind. But you'll get paid. You don't have to worry about that. 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city. Believed on him. For the saying of the woman who testified, he told me all that ever I did. Well, that woman who Jesus spoke to by the well, that woman was so excited about Jesus and she did not suppress her enthusiasm one bit. She was enthusiastic about Jesus. She went in town. She told people about Christ. And because she did not suppress her excitement about Jesus, it spread it spread to others who ended up getting saved as well. The reality of Jesus Christ in you, the reality of your faith in Christ, and the truth about Jesus that you speak are the very things that God will use to bring others to Christ. 40. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would stay with them. And he abode there two days. So these people, these men of the city, that the Samaritan woman told about Jesus, they believed her, they went out to investigate Jesus on their own, and they talked to him, and they didn't want to quit. They talked to Jesus, and once they started talking to him, they didn't want Jesus to leave. He stayed with them two days, and they just soaked it all in. They didn't want it to end. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. When you get a taste of fellowship with God, you will want more. When the Bible starts to click in your mind, you're going to want more. Jesus spoke the word of God, and that's why these people didn't want to leave. And they didn't want him to leave. 41. <clears throat> and many more believed because of his own word. So look at that. Look what's happening here. People were, were getting saved. These people who were coming out to listen to Jesus, they were getting saved because Jesus was giving them the word of God. 
People were getting saved because Jesus was speaking the word of God to them. That's how souls are harvested. Do you see that? The devil wants to keep people from hearing the Bible taught. Because he knows how powerful it is and he is scared to death of it. The devil wants a lot of company in hell. So he will do all that he can do to keep people from hearing the Bible and being saved as a result. He will work overtime. Just look at what's happening here in verse 41. And many more believed because of his own word. Satan cannot stop the mighty power of God's word when a hungry soul is taking it in. So he tries to keep preachers from preaching it. He'll get preachers to preach psychology or to tell stories or to try to be comedians or something like that to entertain the people, but don't give them out the straight word of God. Don't give out the straight word of God. Or else he'll just keep people, try to keep people away from those who do preach the word of God. He just works desperately. Because he, know, he, he knows he cannot stop the power of God's word from doing good. 41. And many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe. Not because of thy saying. For we have heard him ourselves. And know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So Jesus stays with these men for two days. And they soak up his words like a sponge. And now you know what he told them. Because Jesus, through the scriptures, convinced these people that he is the Savior of the world. That's what they came away understanding. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Meaning this. Jesus is it. There is no other. Jesus is it. Jesus, the only, Jesus is the only Savior that there is. Jesus is the Savior of the world. And I don't care how religious someone may be. If they have never repented of their sin and they have never asked Jesus Christ to save them from hell, then they are as lost and hell-bound as anyone. Jesus is the Savior of the world. The Bible says, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. That's what it boils down to. You get into heaven by Jesus or you don't get in at all. You avoid hell by Jesus or you can't avoid hell at all. He is the Savior of the world. 43. Now after two days, he departed from there and went into Galilee. Galilee was in northern Israel. It was the northern region of Israel. Jesus grew up in northern Israel. 44. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. Nazareth was the little village in Galilee where Jesus was raised. And after he started his preaching ministry, he tried to teach the people of his hometown the word of God a couple of times, but they tried to kill him. Tough audience. Always is. Hometown crowds are usually the toughest audience for a preacher. That's what Jesus is saying. And it's not just a preacher. It's true, some of the hardest people to talk to about their need for Jesus Christ are those who are the closest to us, those members of our own family. 45. Then, when he was coming to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast. For they also, they also went unto the feast. So, a lot of people that Jesus preached to in northern Israel, Galilee, had been down in Jerusalem when he was there. And they heard, <clears throat> excuse me, they heard him preach down there in Jerusalem. And consequently, when they returned home, they spread the news about Jesus. So the people up north recognized Jesus when he came around and started preaching. They knew who he was. 46. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Jesus did his first miracle in Cana. He changed the water into wine at a wedding. 
<clears throat> and here he returns. And because news of his miracle had spread, a man with a very sick son is going to approach Jesus and ask him for help. It says, A certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. 47. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Jesus was this man's only hope. This man knew that his dying son had one chance of living, and that chance was Jesus Christ. And so he approaches him, and he says, Will you come to my place and heal my son, Jesus? 48. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. Jesus wants people to believe in him. In other words, Jesus wants, wants people to trust him. He wants people to trust his word. He wants people to trust the word of God. And he wants people to trust that he will save their soul from hell if they only ask him to. He wants people to trust him. He wants people to have faith in him. A faith that may be encouraged by a miracle, but doesn't demand one. 49. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down before my child dieth. This man had faith in Jesus, obviously, or he never would have approached Christ and asked for help. So he has faith in Jesus, but his faith had a couple of flaws. His first flaw, he thought Jesus had to be physically present by his son in order to heal him. The second flaw, he thought that his son, if, it, if he died, it would be too late for Jesus to do anything. Both were wrong. He was wrong. He put limits on Jesus Christ. You can't put limits on Christ. You can't put limits on God. The power of Jesus Christ has no limits. I say that to say this. When you pray, remember, the power of Jesus Christ has no limits. Verse 50. <clears throat> Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way. Thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. So, <clears throat> the man must have believed Jesus. Or he never would have left Christ and returned home by himself. The Lord said, Your son is healed. The man obviously believed. And because he believed, he set off for home by himself. If he didn't believe, he would have stayed there and continued to bug Jesus to come along with him. But he believed, and he showed it by his action. Faith without works is dead. What we believe is always reflected in how we act. Always. So if we have faith in Christ, a faith that saves us from hell, our life is going to show that. 51. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. <clears throat> then inquired he of them the hour when he began to improve. And they said unto him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth. And he himself believed, and his whole house. His son got better at the exact same time that Jesus had said, Go your way, your son lives. And the father knew beyond all doubt, his son got well it was a miracle. That happened because of the spoken word of Jesus Christ, even though he was miles away. Jesus didn't have to be there with his son physically, because as God, there is power in his word. Think about the power of God's word. The same spoken word of God that created the entire universe, including man, cured this son of a deadly illness. That's the power of God's holy word. That's why I proclaim it. That's why I teach it. That's why it's smart for you to be where it is taught. And that's why the devil hates it. There is power in the word of God. Next time, chapter 5. Until then, so long everyone.